So you already read the title for me, which I uh, apologize for the long wording. Um, and I just jump right in. So I thought it would be a good idea to um, to start with a brief background of what we um, understand by saying dementia. Um, so clinically, there are, we um, we differentiate between different types of uh, dementia, and the most common type is uh, Alzheimer's dementia, which is uh, clinically characterized by a typical um, um, amnestic, predominant, multi-domain uh, dementia profile. And uh, this can be distinguished clinically from other types of dementia, such as uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, which has uh, which is more executive, um, uh, more characterized by executive dysfunction and visuospatial impairments, and not so much by uh, prominent uh, memory deficits. Uh, and and there are different types of dementia, such as uh, behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, which uh, is more characterized well by uh, behavioral deficits. So whenever we are in the clinic. Um, the neurologist sees uh, a dementia that seems to be caused by uh, predominant memory deficits, then um, this is um, diagnosed as possible or probable Alzheimer's dementia. So why possible or probable? Because these dementia phenotypes are caused by specific diseases and in the type and the, in the case of Alzheimer's dementia, uh, it's caused by Alzheimer's disease. And this is defined pathologically by the accumulation of, uh, of, um, of abnormal protein aggregates. Uh, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, this is uh, abnormal aggregates of amyloid beta protein and of uh, tau protein. And so this is the uh, pathologic definition of Alzheimer's disease and uh, this uh, Somehow this protein accumulation leads to neuronal dysfunction, neurodegeneration, and, um, and then uh, to this clinical, typical clinical picture of amnestic predominant dementia. Um, well, dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, the name says it all. It's uh, uh, the, the protein aggregate defining this disease is um, so our Lewy bodies, and these consist of alpha synuclein. And uh, same holds true for uh, frontotemporal dementias. The, these can be caused by either tau or uh, TDP43 protein aggregates. There's an, a relatively newly defined dementia syndrome or disease, uh, which is called limbic age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. And I'll talk about that a lot in this uh, presentation. That's why I'm introducing it here. And uh, this is. Uh, supposed to be caused by well TDP43 aggregates. What this uh, graph here also shows is that um, that that there's uh, you have disease defining protein aggregates. This is why these uh, different diseases are also called proteinopathies. So different proteinopathies typically cause different um, uh, clinical dementia phenotypes. But then you also have a big overlap. So you can have uh, in an individual patient, you can have amyloid and tau that would be defining for Alzheimer's disease, but um, this patient may also have alpha synuclein, comorbid pathology. And figuring out which of the different uh, pathologies is like the principal culprit of uh, the observed clinical phenotype of the observed symptoms, that's um, uh, pretty tough in the clinic, and that's why uh, we try to use biomarker for that. Um, so it's one striking observation is that these different uh, dementias, uh, at least as clinically defined dementia phenotypes, are characterized by different patterns of neurodegeneration. So here in this case, different patterns of glucose hypermetabolism as uh, can be imaged in the clinic using FDG PET. So this is here Alzheimer's disease. It's characterized by a very typical uh, pattern of temporal parietal hypermetabolism, with sparing of the frontal lobe and, and occipital, 
cortex. Whereas dementia with Lewy bodies is characterized by a similar temporal parietal, but a more posterior pronounced pattern um, here also involving the occipital lobe and frontal temporal dementia, well, uh, more frontal uh, hypermetabolism. And this, these, these patterns can, um, can also be observed for different dementia types. And this is really helpful in the clinic because uh, these dementia presentations are not always very clear. So it may be a nestic, but there may be some uh, visuospatial um, uh, deficits also, or hallucinations, which are more characteristic of dementia with Lewy bodies. And so looking at the uh, individual FDG pet pattern may give the mm, treating neurologist a clue of uh, uh, what's the underlying uh, uh, disease or uh, the, the underlying uh, dement dementing disorder, let's say. And uh, why is this important? Because uh, so here in this graph, you see um, amyloid positivity rates either assessed by amyloid PET or by autopsy, um, neuropathological examination at autopsy, um, from clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's dementia cases. And as you can see here, uh, especially there's, there's a, a quite considerable proportion of these uh, clinically diagnosed Alzheimer's dementia cases do not have amyloid pathology, that meaning they do not have Alzheimer's pathology uh, in their brains. So these are, let's say, clinical misdiagnosis, because what, what actually has been diagnosed is an amnestic predominant uh, dementia syndrome which most often associates with Alzheimer's disease, but as you can see here, not always. And especially in the higher age range, this can go up, uh, up to 30, 35% of uh, amnestic dementia syndromes that are, do not have Alzheimer's disease pathology, meaning they have some kind of, they have a different type of pathology causing um, this uh, amnestic dementia syndrome. And uh, over the last years, um, uh, it has been found that one of the principal uh, age-related neuropathologies that uh, mimic AD uh, clinically, that result in a similar uh, amnestic predominant um, dementia profile being diagnosed as AD dementia in the clinic, is uh, late, or limbic predominant age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. So this from here and uh, this graph, there's uh, uh, these are all clinically, so the neuropathologic examinations of clinically diagnosed uh, AD dementia patients. And as you can see here, that actually only a quarter of them actually have pure AD pathology. There are a lot of comorbid cases. We don't really know what's the main contributor here, uh, but there are also cases, uh, quite a considerable portion of cases who do not have AD pathology, but have late as the single uh, underlying neurodegenerative pathology, single proteinopathy uh, found in these individuals, probably causing their dementia syndromes. And uh, unfortunately, this is really hard to diagnose in the clinic because they cause the same clinical phenotype. And so uh, it would be nice to use biomarkers um, to, uh, to be able to diagnose this condition during lifetime. However, there are no, we have molecular biomarkers, we have molecular, we have blood, even blood biomarkers for, uh, for AD, uh, PET imaging biomarkers for, that are specific for amyloid and tau um, protein, um, but we do not have similar biomarkers for late. So um, what's being done is um, at, at the moment, is that whenever you see an amnestic dementia patient and you see that there's no amyloid pathology present in the biomarker, so this is shown here as an example, uh, no amyloid in an amyloid PET scan, no tau in a tau PET scan, but an amnestic dementia, progressive amnestic dementia profile and severe uh, hippocampal degeneration. And so this is suggestive of um, that uh, of late instead of Alzheimer's. So they, by definition, this patient does not have Alzheimer's disease. And so uh, I already said that um, late also frequently 
uh, associates with hippocampal sclerosis, meaning severe hippocampal degeneration, and which likely explains why uh, it is it may it often results in a, a similar amnestic predominant dementia profile. So the condition, uh, this, it, this, this whole term and the whole, let's say, disease has only been categorized a few years ago um, and it, it's still being studied. And what's known so far is that it's, uh, it's strongly associated with advanced age. Uh, it has a si very similar, well, dementia profile, but it, uh, longitudinally it uh, shows a more protracted disease course and um, it also appears to be more amnestic specific, so it's uh, relatively spared executive functions. Um, it has been associated with some uh, genetic risk factors, especially TMM106B risk allele, which had previously been associated with TDP43 pathology in front of uh, temporal lower degeneration. Seems to uh, be specific for TDP43, not so much for, uh, for late in general. And uh, then, at least when compared to AD dementia patients uh, or AD pathology, late uh, also uh, associated with a lower frequency of the um, ApoE4 allele, which uh, of course is the most, uh, is the best established genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So, um, what we wanted to do in uh, one of our recent studies is to to see whether, uh, whether we can find an FDG PET signature of late, uh, same, in the same way as Alzheimer's disease uh, has its uh, known signature, dementia with Lewy bodies has its known si signature, like being more uh, posterior occipital compared to Alzheimer's disease. And we wanted to see if maybe late uh, is characterized by its own uh, FDG PET signature, which could then be used uh, similar to this other signature for uh, aiding differential dementia diagnosis. And for that, we made use of uh, data from the ethnic autopsy cohort, um, which uh, had individuals who were had neuropathological examination at autopsy, but uh, had undergone uh, FDG PET scanning during lifetime on average three years uh, before death. And in this data set, uh, we identified uh, seven patients, uh, all diagnosed either as AD dementia or at least amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment. Um, seven of these uh, patients had limbic TDP43 pathology, but no or only very low AD pathology. So in these, uh, we have classified them as late. So this meets the uh, pathologic diagnostic criteria for late. And then a comparison group had uh, were 23 patients who had standard high AD pathology without any coma with TDP43. And so first of all, we see that this uh, pure autopsy mm, confirmed AD group has this very characteristic temporal parietal um, hypometabolic pattern here, also involving the medial temporal lobe to a similar degree as these temporal parietal areas in the posterior cingulate. However, these uh, late individuals, despite having the same clinical diagnosis, showed very different uh, hypometabolic pattern, which is much more uh, temporal limbic predominant, so it's most pronounced hypometabolism in the uh, medial temporal lobe, um, much less so in these uh, uh, lateral temporal parietal areas. So uh, this was one of the first descriptions of an uh, FDG PET signature of late. And we then want to well use this signature to see if it if it may be helpful for differential dementia diagnosis, and for that uh, we examined FDG PET scans of a large of a larger in vivo cohort of uh, almost 250 patients with a clinical diagnosis of AD dementia, with the assumption that some of uh, these patients may be misdiagnosed and may have late instead of Alzheimer's disease and. Uh, Consequently, they should show an FDG PET hypermetabolic profile that's more suggestive or that's more similar to the FD, to the late signature than to the classical temporal parietal AD signature. And uh, 
using these autopsy or pathology defined uh, signatures. We used and uh, developed an automated uh, pattern matching approach, with it, which is based on spatial correlation. Um, and using this approach, we indeed uh, found a subset of about 10% of these uh, patients where then, um, well, a hyper, an individual hypermetabolic pattern much more similar to this late pattern than to the AD pattern. And not surprisingly, a uh, much larger portion of these patients uh, showed the classical AD-like uh, temporal parietal pattern of hypermetabolism. And uh, this is just uh, showing you the average hypermetabolic patterns of the automatically classified um, patients and or FDG PET scans. And uh, this basically just to show you that the um, algorithm, it's a, it's a sanity check. So it basically just tells us that, that the al algorithm seems to do a pretty good job despite being completely automatic. So this, this it, it, it reproduces this, this temporal parietal pattern in these in the AD like group and this temporal limbic pattern in the late like group. I call them AD like and late like because we don't know uh, their underlying pathologies. Um, uh, we just say that their FDG pet pattern is more suggestive of being uh, of uh, more suggestive of AD in one case and more suggestive of uh, late in the other case. So, um, what does it make? Does it make any difference clinically? Um, it actually does a whole lot of a difference. So, um, if we look at some of these clinical features, first of all, we see that these late-like individuals are much older than the AD-like individuals, almost uh, well, on average, a decade older. Um, they show a more uh, a slower overall disease course over longitudinal follow-up, and they show a more amnestic predominant cognitive profile, so more uh, uh, memory deficit compared to uh, the executive function deficit uh, as uh, uh, indicated here by this cognitive profile variable, which subtracts summary scores between these two cognitive domains. Um, so all these clinical features uh, that have been uh, described uh, for of being associated with late pathology. Um, looking at biomarkers, we see indeed that these uh, late-like and uh, cases have much less abnormal amyloid and uh, tau biomarkers um, than the AD-like cases, indicating that it may be some other pathology uh, mostly responsible for driving this uh, dementia phenotype in these patients. Um, and the obviously implicit assumption here is that uh, this other pathology would be TDP43 or late pathology. Um, the genetic data also uh, was went in the same line. So we see uh, a much lower proportion of ApoE4 allele carriers in these late cases, so a complete lack of homozygous carriers of the ApoE4 allele in these cases. And uh, by contrast, uh, the late cases were enriched for the TMM106B risk allele that had been previously associated with TDP43 pathology with a complete lack of uh, homozygous carriers of the protective uh, C allele. So, um, it's not, not everything is late. We're, uh, we have to deal with a whole bunch of uh, um, neurodegenerative dementias which could underlie and um, clinical dementia syndrome, even if this uh, dementia syndrome is uh, um, amnestic and more suggestive of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, using data from the same uh, autopsy cohort, uh, my colleague Jesus um, found that about 12% of the clinically diagnosed AD dementia patients did not have AD pathology, but did actually have Lewy body pathology as the underlying uh, principal proteinopathy. And uh, here uh, he could demonstrate that uh, these patients indeed showed a very different hypermetabolic pattern uh, compared to the um, autopsy confirmed AD dementia cases. 
uh, and this, this uh, they showed uh, this more posterior uh, and occipital hypermetabolism, which is um, more typical indeed for dementia with Lewy bodies. So this made a lot of sense here. So we tried to do a, a similar analysis I've, as I've just shown you before for um, the late pattern to see if we uh, if this is useful for um, differential dementia diagnosis, even in cases that are clinically diagnosed as AD dementia, so they already have a quite uh, high likelihood, uh, at least to the um, uh, treating physician of having uh, Alzheimer's disease. And for that, we again use these clinically diagnosed AD dementia patients. I should mention that these are uh, um, patients that are included in the ADNI study. This is for Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative. It's a publicly available database. Um, and uh, it's, an, um, it's a large scale, multicentric uh, US, American and Canadian um, study on Alzheimer's disease. And so you can imagine that only like if if someone has an clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in this study, then it's uh, it, this won't include like more clinically suspicious cases. So these have uh, are really relatively clean amnestic uh, phenotypes because if not, they wouldn't uh, they would not have been included into that study focused on Alzheimer's disease. But still using a similar pattern, pattern matching approach as I've shown you before, uh, we found that about 13% of the full sample um, had um, this uh, posterior occipital hypermetabolic pattern um, suggestive of dementia with Lewy bodies instead of this uh, to AD typical pattern. And uh, when looking at the biomarkers, we found that these uh, they did not really these patients did not really differ in terms of the amyloid pathology, which is maybe not too surprising because uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is uh, uh, there's a big overlap with uh, amyloid pathology too. But we found a, a, a much less pronounced uh, tau pathology burden in these uh, DLB-like uh, dementia cases compared to the classical AD-like cases. And in terms of uh, clinical profile, here we saw that uh, these uh, DLB-like cases based on the FDG PET pattern had indeed a more disexecutive um, predominant profile, which is what we would expect because DLB um, as, a, as a, a clinical dementia syndrome it is much more disexecutive than compared to Alzheimer's disease. And I've mentioned it before, uh, DRB is also associated with, uh, much more strongly associated with the development of hallucinations. Um, and here um, we could indeed demonstrate that these DRB like patients, clinically diagnosed AD dementia patients with an FDG PET pattern suggestive of Lewy body disease, uh, these patients do indeed are indeed at a much higher risk of developing hallucinations compared um, to the classical AD patients. So um, this in summary, uh, we can say that these uh, that um, these FDG PET patterns are dementia specific. We can use dementia specific FDG PET patterns and use them for differential dementia diagnosis, not only um, like in uh, equivocal cases, but also uh, they also provide uh, significant uh, clinical information for uh, for um, for patients who have a relatively clean um, amnestic predominant dementia profile, but still uh, within that overall dementia di clinical dementia diagnosis, we see that these uh, regional FDG PET patterns still provide um, uh, clinically meaningful information. Here, for example, for further future development of hallucinations. So what about uh, earlier disease stages? Dementia is, uh, for all what we know, a relatively advanced stage of disease. Um, and um, so uh, clinically, prodromes of dementia have been uh, defined, and the most commonly used uh, construct is uh, mild cognitive impairment, or a, a, in the context of amnestic 
in the context of Alzheimer's disease often are limited to amnestic mild cognitive impairment, which means you have cognitive deficits um, that are uh, about objective uh, cognitive deficits in the memory domain, uh, but that are not severe enough to interfere with activities of daily living, which would uh, be required for a, a diagnosis of dementia. And for many years, when I started uh, uh, studying um, or when I was doing my PhD studies, amnestic MCI was basically treated as a prodrome for Alzheimer's disease. Um, there was amnestic MCI equals prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And it has become increasingly clear that, that this is uh, um, not the case and this is just a, too much of a simplification. And here this is a very enlightening study, neuropathology studies of uh, amnestic MCI cases uh, where you can see that only about 20% of these cases actually have pure AD pathology, whereas the large majority have uh, AD mixed with other types of pathology, and we don't know what's the driving, uh, what's the driving force here. And then there's uh, still a considerable portion uh, who do not have uh, any AD pathology, uh, so they do not have amyloid, and when uh, in the paper, they, they look at this in more detail and they found uh, different pathology, such as the uh, Lewy body pathology, TDP43 and hippocampal sclerosis or late. Uh, I've shown you these examples before. And then a very common condition was also part primary age-related tauopathy, which refers to the accumulation of tau pathology, of uh, AD-like tau pathology in the absence of amyloid. If there's no amyloid, it cannot be AD. So, um, but still, it's a very common observation that this tau pathology can also occur without amyloid, and this is now termed uh, primary age-related tauopathy. So there's uh, surprisingly little data on, um, on the uh, heterogeneity of FDG pet patterns that can be found in the uh, MCI population. This is one of uh, the uh, earlier study, well, it's quite some time ago already. It's quite old already, but uh, it's one of the most comprehensive studies still. Um, uh, and here, it, because it included about 100 something MCI patients, here it was, you can see that, uh, well, uh, uh, a quarter of them have a clear 80 typical pattern. Then you have, as we have seen in, uh, also before, um, we have this DLB, more uh, posterior occipital pattern in some patients. Some patients have just no hyper, hypermetabolism at all. And then you have different types of only hippocampal hypermetabolism, only hippocampal plus uh, posterior single hypermetabolism. And this may be early stages of AD, but as we have now, as we nowadays know what an um, late uh, specific uh, signature looks like, this may also include some of these late um, cases here, or late-like FTG pet patterns. And um, so we also looked at this. We, uh, Jesus uh, also looked at whether we could use these patterns. Um, well, our late uh, specific pathology defined late pattern for differential uh, diagnosis in this early disease in, in amnestic MCI patients. And I'm really only going uh, through this here but, um, very briefly now because uh, Jesus presented all this uh, two weeks ago. Um, the bottom line is that we can we see the same uh, effect as we see in these uh, in the um, clinically diagnosed AD dementia patients. So these late-like amnestic MCI patients have much less abnormal uh, AD biomarkers suggesting that they have uh, other pathologies underlying their clinical syndrome, in this case probably TDP43, and uh, they show more protracted disease course and uh, they show considerably higher age compared to the AD-like cases. Um, same, same but different um, for the uh, DLB-like pattern. Bottom line here is again, it works the same way as in the clinically diagnosed AD dementia cases. DLB like uh, amnestic MCI cases with a posterior occipital hypermetabolic pattern, such as of Lewy body pathology, 
to indeed show uh, lower amyloid biomarkers here or and tau biomarkers here based both based on PET. And um, they also show a more dissexative predominant cognitive profile, especially over time. Uh, and uh, they have a higher risk of developing hallucinations over time. So what this means is that um, they even though being mostly indistinguishable at baseline, um, they have uh, they progress. These patients progress towards a more DLB-like uh, dementia with Lewy bodies-like uh, cognitive syndrome. Uh, so we don't know their underlying pathology. We know it's not um, as they do not have as pronounced uh, Alzheimer's pathology. We know that because we have biomarkers for that. We don't have biomarkers for Lewy body pathology, at least not here in this study. They are being developed right now. Um, but we can be so we don't really know if they have Lewy body pathology, but we, we can say that it makes clinical sense because it and it's uh, informative because we can predict future uh, clinical trajectories based just based on these FDG pet patterns. Um, so since Jesus pre already presented this data two weeks ago, here yeah, I wanted um, to uh, focus on these, these last slides. Let's see. Um, uh, last five or six slides, I think, um, to focus on part primary age-related topathy, which is uh, apparently is a very common finding in uh, amnestic MCI patients and um, and so should be considered as a common um, well, well underlying pathology uh, of if, if you encounter an amnestic MCI patient in the clinic you wonder whether whether this patient has Alzheimer's disease maybe late maybe Lewy body pathology um, um, or um, maybe he's, so he's just suffering from primary age-related tauropathy. And so what, what this is, it, it really basically only refers to the definition, it's a, it's a pathologic definition, and it refers to the accumulation of AD-like neurofibrillary, neurofibrillary tau tangles that are indistinguishable in terms of biochemistry um, they are indistinguishable from the um, tau tangles that are seen in Alzheimer's disease. And they also uh, occur preferentially in the medial temporal lobe, as in Alzheimer's disease. However, they appear in the absence of amyloid, so it cannot be Alzheimer's disease. And uh, according to this pathogenetic model, um, there's some age as a driving factor for tau accumulation in the medial temporal lobe. No amyloid at this point. And this by itself may or may not have uh, some effects on cognitive decline. Um, in the, when, when a patient develops amyloid, then he's uh, in the pathologic um, uh, AD pathway, Alzheimer's disease pathway, and here this uh, amyloid accumulation, wherever it comes from, also age, uh, maybe uh, uh, um, well um, promoted by specific genetic risk factors. Um, this then uh, propagates, according to this pathogenic model, propagates tau accumulation within the medial temporal lobe, but especially propagates tau accumulation outside of the medial temporal lobe in neocortical areas, and there is. This neocortical tau, which is um, what is most or, or more robustly associated with severe cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, and in this case, Alzheimer's disease dementia. So um, a main problem with um, the whole construct of PART and this pathogenic genetic model is that PART is a pathologic um, entity it can only but it can only be diagnosed at autopsy, so we really don't know uh, what's happening to uh, individuals who have part. How uh, part progressive uh, progresses if it sometimes spread into the neocortex? Um, uh, what what happens to individuals who have part on the long run? Do they develop 
uh, amyloid pathology and hence Alzheimer's disease uh, as the disease developed or not. We don't really know and it's a big uh, controversy in the in the field still um, because we can't do longitudinal studies. However, we do have um, amyloid PET and we do have tau PET now. And so what we wanted to do in this uh, study published uh, this year in German Neurology and in which was we conducted in collaboration with uh, well, my colleagues at the University of Gothenburg and also at the, here in Spain at the University of uh, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, we wanted to use a, uh, a make use of a very large data set, a multi cohort study that we uh, pooled uh, amyloid and tau PET data from several centers worldwide and um, and see if we can uh, what if we can define and or find an imaging analogon to uh, the pathologic entity of part. And uh, so the overall data set included uh, almost uh, well over 1000 elderly individuals who had both amyloid and tau PET scan. And we used this data to well to classify these individuals whether they had amyloid evidence of amyloid in their scans, amyloid of medial temporal tau in their scans. If they had uh, okay, so this is wrong. This should be a minus. No evidence of amyloid, but evidence of medial temporal tau. Then we could would call them part or imaging analogon of part. And if they had both, well, that's a classic uh, biomarker definition of Alzheimer's disease. And at looking at these at baseline, first of all, we see that these have um, these part cases, uh, imaging defined part cases have indeed uh, tau pathology restricted, mainly restricted to the medial temporal lobe. So it's no surprise they have a lot of tau pathology here because that is how we defined them, but they don't have it basically anywhere else or not, not, not about, well, not important amounts of it. And this is very different to these uh, cases, to these AD cases who have uh, uh, also amyloid pathology because here they were defined in the same way based on tau positivity in the medial temporal lobe. But here um, they have, uh, we see they have much more extensive tau pathology and in this typical temporal parietal pattern we also um, see in the uh, FTG PET scans. Now what's uh, like really new about this study is that uh, a, a large subset of these uh, individuals also had longitudinal uh, amyloid and tau PET scans. And here uh, we could first, for the first time, we could demonstrate that these individuals really also longitudinally, uh, if there's no amyloid, the uh, tau mainly or on average um, uh, seems to uh, remain restricted to the medial temporal lobe. It spreads to some uh, uh, um, surrounding neocortical areas, but not as severe as here in the medial temporal lobe. Uh, it does so. Um, it does so. Uh, continue to accumulate in the medial temporal lobe, and that's not necessarily a good thing by itself. So, and I come back to that later. Um, however, in these, uh, if there's amyloid present, then you're in the. Uh, by definition, you have Alzheimer's disease. You're in the uh, Alzheimer's trajectory, and your tower accumulation, progressive tower accumulation, goes. Uh, well, wide right above the uh, medial temporal lobe to these neocortical areas. Um, this is just a confirmation that it's not something we are only seeing in the in the PET scans. We are seeing the same thing in their uh, cerebrospinal fluid biomarker profiles. So these part cases do not differ and do not have any evidence of amyloid pathology uh, in these biomarkers, but they do uh, have uh, slightly increased uh, CSF P tau values, the uh, tau biomarker. So these are not as much increased as in the AD group, which is expected given their spatially restricted uh, tau pathology, but still it's a kind of uh, uh, independent biomarker evidence that uh, we're looking at real tau pathology here. And they also accumulate uh, tau pathology uh, faster over time compared to the controls. 
Um, I've already mentioned it, so this may, that this tower accumulation may not be a good thing. Uh, it's not a completely benign process because if we look at newer degeneration patterns um, based on structural MRI data, we see that in these same areas that accumulate tau, uh, these uh, uh, part individuals show increased atrophy compared to the um, to the tau negative controls. Um, uh, both at baseline and longitudinally progressive medial temporal lobe uh, degeneration, but uh, it remains restricted to the medial temporal lobe. And here in these AD cases, um, atrophy spreads uh, is already present at baseline and then spreads also to other neocortical areas. Um, at least uh, when looking at uh, global cognitive scores, which is which was everything that we had uh, available for that multi cohort study, um, this um, tower accumulation in these part cases uh, did not result in marked or in pronounced cognitive deficits. Here, this global uh, ADAS COG measure, uh, neither at baseline nor longitudinally, so no faster global cognitive decline in these cases, which means. They do, these part cases do show progressive tower accumulation in the medial temporal lobe, progressive medial temporal neurodegeneration, but they uh, appear to be mostly asymptomatic. Okay, let me have a look at the time. Okay, thanks, you're good. Um, so this is, uh, well, Say it again. The summary that these uh, part cases it does not mm, appear to be a benign profile, um, process because it associates with neurodegeneration. Um, however, it, uh, they do not appear to have this uh, um, pronounced cognitive decline um, that we are seeing in these uh, AD cases. So I should mention that most of these cases were cognitively normal or uh, maximum MCI at baseline. And so they, when they're amyloid and tau positive, they have a very high risk of developing cognitive decline over follow up here. And um, so these are what's important to keep in mind here, especially with uh, the, when looking at the title of this uh, presentation. Uh, talking about personalized medicine, that these are average statistics. So on average, it remains restricted in the medial temporal lobe. We do have some effects here that blur out in this average, and on average, it remains longitudinally also in the medial in the medial temporal lobe. Neurodegeneration on average remains in the medial temporal lobe, and cognition on average remains relatively stable, but this may not be the case for all of uh, the individuals. And if we look at um, like uh, tau pathology in uh, large scale autopsy cohorts, uh, that which did not have neuroimaging, but here we're um, there, especially in the US, there are very large um, and publicly available um, autopsy cohorts or data from autopsy cohorts. Um, that, that includes thousands of individuals. And uh, here in this study, they looked at the distribution of Brax stages. So this Brax stage is uh, a way to, well, to stage the severity of tau pathology. And uh, where these early stages refer to medial temporal tau pathology, and then three and four, especially four as a transitional stage towards neocortical areas and five and six, in stages five and six, the tau pathology has progressed to uh, more advanced neocortical areas. And as I have sh shown you before, so these are all amyloid negative cases. They e either have only no neurotic plaques, amyloid plaques at all, or only very few uh, uh, amyloid plaques. And uh, if you look at them, well, indeed, uh, most of these cases have tau pathology limited to the medial temporal lobe, but uh, more advanced neocortical tau pathology, so Prax stages four and uh, higher, um, is less common, but it does occur. It can be observed, and uh, this is particularly the case for cognitively impaired individuals. So meaning 
that um, when it can occur and when it occurs, it associates with um, with cognitive impairment. So again, primary age related tauopathy, often an asymptomatic process that maybe associates with only subtle memory deficits. Um, that's most often the case, but for some completely unknown reasons in some individuals, it can also progress towards uh, more widespread neocortical areas in the absence of amyloid. And in these cases, it can uh, produce uh, cognitive impairments that uh, may be very similar to um, early stages of AD. So amnestic MCI or included uh, or even an amnestic predominant memory, um, amnestic predominant dementia profile. So in this uh, final slide here, OK, no, sorry. We wanted to see whether we can find these individuals here in these red boxes if we can find them on an individual basis using amyloid and tau pet. So amyloid, neg amyloid pet negative individuals who have a uh, positive uh, neocortical tau pet signal. And this uh, is data, two cases we identified in the large triad cohort that perfectly um, fulfill uh, this condition. And we included them in a commentary we, uh, I wrote this year with my uh, colleague from McGill um, in, for Brain. And uh, we also found that the, today, this year, an analysis of, um, of clinically diagnosed AD dementia patients who had a negative amyloid PET scan uh, found that about 25% of these patients actually had um, a mere, medial temporal lobe tau and neocortical tau, so widespread neo neocortical tau, probably similar to what we're seeing here. So in this uh, final study, in this final slide, this is a very, um, very new data now that has not, not been published uh, anywhere uh, so far. Um, we wanted to see whether we can identify these um, amyloid negative cases with a more widespread neocortical tau deposition um, in a more systematic manner. And for that, we, we analyzed an even bigger multi-cohort uh, study uh, with over 2,000 individuals who all had combined amyloid and tau pet scans. And we used this uh, visual rating uh, scale for uh, detecting neocortical tau pathology and tau pet. So yes, all of these almost 2,500 uh, tau pet scans have been visually rated, manually rated by my colleague Alexis Moscoso uh, for the presence of neocortical tau pathology. And here, the bottom line finding is that indeed it is a relatively rare finding. So only 5% of the amyloid negative individuals have neocortical tau pathology. However, among those with cognitive impairment, this uh, proportion was considerably higher. So 10% is definitely not a ne negligible uh, proportion of, uh, of, uh, of patients. And uh, when we look at some of the characteristics, we see they fulfill the uh, what characteristics we would expect for advanced uh, part. This is a uh, um, significantly higher age. They do not, in contrast to these uh, A plus T plus AD cases, they were not significantly enriched for the EPOE4 risk allele, but they showed a similar degree of uh, cognitive impairment, of proportion of patients with cognitive impairment compared to the uh, A plus uh, T plus cases. So um, or at least uh, a much higher proportion compared to the negative cases. And the biomarker da data finally confirmed what we see in the uh, PET scans. So no uh, abnormal amyloid uh, biomarker consistent with the uh, negative amyloid PET scan, but significantly elevated uh, P tau, tau pathology biomarker consistent with the visual rating of neocortical tau pathology. And this is what this looks on average. OK. So this brings me to my conclusions. Oh, sorry, I want to uh, now all together anyway. So the in the first part, 
um, of this presentation, I've shown you that distinct neurodegenerative dementias are characterized by differential patterns of cerebral hypermetallism on FDG pad. And this can be used as a topographic imaging biomarker to aid differential dementia diagnosis. This is particularly useful in the setting where um, molecular biomarkers are not available yet for most of the uh, proteinopathies that exist. They are really only established biomarkers are really only available for amyloid and tau, meaning Alzheimer's disease pathology. And uh, this is even helpful uh, in, in uh, relatively clean AD typical dementia presentations. So in the second part, uh, I've shown you how amyloid and tau pet combined can be used to detect and study longitudinally uh, tau accumulation in the absence of amyloid beta pathology. And this is uh, pathologically um, defined as primary age-related tauopathy. So we could confirm some, um, longitudinally confirm some assumptions that have, have been made based on the uh, well cross-sectional autopsy data. Uh, and that is that this um, tau pathology mainly stays restricted to the medial temporal lobe and this associates with co-localized neurodegeneration, but is often acidentic. So it's uh, not a benign process, but it doesn't lead to these severe dementia syndromes. However, in some cases, it can show more, ex uh, more extensive neocortical distribution, uh, which then also associates with cognitive impairments that may mimic early stages AD, so amnestic MCI or even an amnestic predominant um, early dementia syndrome. And uh, using these imaging technologies, we have uh, we can follow patients longitudinally, we can uh, have access to much wider uh, cohorts. And, um, and so one of the next steps will be to find out what, what are possible genetic or other driving factors that, uh, that can drive uh, progression of tau pathology even in the end, absence of amyloid. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank all my colleagues here at the EBS. That's uh, unfortunately a somewhat old photo, so I've, uh, I've added uh, our new members here, uh, some of our new group members, especially those uh, working in, in the line of neuroimaging research in our group. This is uh, Pablo Mir, the head of the whole movement disorders group funding sources and uh, my international collaborators at the University of Gothenburg. Thank you. All right, uh, Michel, um, thank you very much uh, for a very nice presentation, very exciting. Um, so the paper is now open for discussion. Um, if anyone is interested in posting um, a question to, the, uh, to, uh, to Michel, please uh, do so by using the uh, raise hand option on your screen. And I will give you um, the floor to make the questions yourself. Um, you can also use the chat uh, to uh, let me know that you're interested in making a questions. And um, if anyone has no microphone available, uh, you can also write down the question through the chat and I will read it to, uh, to the speaker. OK, so while we uh, wait for the first question, let me just uh, remind everyone that the um, webinar today has been or is being recorded and the recording will be available at the CyberNet website in the next uh, few days, couple of weeks. Um, also, if you're interested in um, uh, future um, uh, webinars, uh, you can go to the CyberNet website and we have the program uh, already closed for uh, the rest of the year. And uh, if you're interested in participating in this seminar series, uh, please send us a message, uh, an email message to either myself or Teresa Iglesias, who is the um, uh, responsible for the training program at Cybernet. Um, since we are now uh, trying to fill it, all the uh, dates available for the next uh, six months from the end of the year till uh, June 2024. All right. So, any questions then? <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, Diana Ortega wants uh, to make a question. Diana, please go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation. Sure. Um, it was Hi. very interesting. 
Um, I was wondering if you envision uh, FDG PET as a clinical biomarker, how do you envision it like um, establishing a threshold for a given set of regions or as an automated classification algorithm or just in a visual check uh, done by the radiographer? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have to say it, it is actually already a pretty well established uh, clinical biomarker. So in the, at least at the context of differential diagnosis of AD versus Lewy body dementia or differential dementia diagnosis, it is actually quite commonly used at, at least in uh, tertiary, tertiary referral centers. Um, I guess like one of the main or closest um, findings that are closest to a uh, clinical application should be simply to add um, um, this late specific uh, signature to um, uh, well to, to, to the toolkit so uh, which basically means since these are visual mainly used visual interpretations basically basically means just to uh, educate <laughs> um, neurologists and um, and well, uh, uh, physicians from the nuclear medicine department who are trained in uh, reading these uh, FDG PET scans to be aware of uh, this specific uh, signature, which in some other cases may have been, um, I don't know, uh, maybe interpreted as an early AD pattern or something like that, since it's so focused on the medial temporal lobe. Um, so this would be, I think, the first step to translation of some of these findings. And uh, as a second step, I think it would make much more sense. So what, what our automated classification algorithm tries to reproduce is actually precisely what, um, what a, a human reader in his mind uh, does. So he has a uh, mental representation of these different dementia patterns and sees whether the, and has to decide whether uh, this individual uh, FDG pet pattern he's looking at, he or she, um, uh, is, uh, uh, is consistent with any of these dementia-specific patterns that uh, the human reader should have in mind. And um, so I can't think of any good reason why this should not be automated. Uh, which which would be much more which would be much faster and um, and more accepted because you would wouldn't need to rely on a mental representation that someone uh, has that a, a professional reader has in its mind but you can use autopsy defined um, patterns of these uh, well audit, audit, autopsy defined templates of these uh, dementia specific patterns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you can always com combine both, I guess, like yeah, in an automated. Yeah. So it's not awesome. mostly exclusive. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Diana and Michelle. Um, any other questions from the audience? Happy it was so clear. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any raised hands. Um, no messages coming through the chat to the chat either. So um, okay, so let's. Um, I know that uh, Michel uh, have um, um, some domestic issues uh, to take care of, so we shouldn't be much longer. But. Um, let me give uh, everyone the last um, chance to make a question. Um, no, no questions. All right, then. Um, then if there are no more questions, um, I think it's time to um, close the session here, but not before. Uh, thank you, Michel, for a very nice presentation and for his willingness to uh, to share his work with uh, with us. And um, uh, and that's it. So uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. And I'll see you here um, probably next um, uh, webinar in two weeks. All right. Okay. Thank have you a good very day. Much. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.